Okay, so I think I'll say something. There's, there are a few questions here. I think I will actually start with those. Uh, First of all, how is it going? How do you feel? Great? Good? Some, I kind of sense that some bit like this. Tiredness? Some anxiety? Also? That's totally fine, you know, it's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, mm, I was just thinking to myself that um anxiety strong negative emotions uh you know the whole roller coaster uh that's the uh, that's the soil where buddhism thrives right uh like buddhism differs or Buddha Dharma, teachings of the Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, Buddhas before him and Buddhas after him, um, differ from um, other kinds of dharmas. Well, not that much really, but uh, there is some, of course, with every kind of dharma or religion, there is some clarification that happens to our uh, self-biased emotions and selfing, right? But Buddhism is clearly different in the sense of Vipassana, Vipassana principle, which is the investigative uh, insight principle, investigative attitude which leads to insight. And insight means an irreversible shift or shifts. So that's where Buddha Dharma is, is, you know, clearly different from Hindu Dharma or other practices. Yeah, so... Um, um, if we would try to... Even if we were lucky to uh, even if we didn't have if you didn't know any of the stuff you know now and any of the practices you know now and even if we were lucky to somehow have some technique or know how to cut through into the natural state still i think uh, it would be very hard to what's the word like really stabilize the natural state without insight practices, without vipassana. I think it would be quite difficult. In Chokchen they speak about this, uh, just practicing directly uh, like this really plain version of Chokchen where you just cut through into the natural state and you keep doing it. When stuff comes up you keep doing it. Um, but for myself, I think I'm an, like an, not an excellent level practitioner, but an intermediate level practitioner, if we have to speak of levels. I'm not an excellent practitioner, that's what I'm saying, because um, I couldn't do without Vipassana practices. Vipassana practices in sutra form, which in open heart method means two-part formula, and object vipassana, which means like when emotions, stuff comes up, you include them in the field of awareness and are aware of them. That's object vipassana. Subject vipassana, two-part formula is the same thing, but the target of it is different. Subject is here, me, subject self is here, and object selves rise up from the subconscious mind. You, uh, you probably know this already, that you know these objects, they, in the inner space of the body-mind, 
emotions and thoughts and whatever dreams and memories they come down from down there they come up into the heart space into the neck space and into the in this head space that's because they come from subconscious mind and subconscious mind is related to the diaphragm gut legs like a area down there down there from the head so what was i saying um, i was speaking of vipassana practices sutra style um, and tantric style of course so tibetan heart yoga with all the techniques it includes and guru yoga it's tantric practice the simple separation what is sutra and what is tantra is in empowerment if there's empowerment involved then it's tantra then it's tantric and in tantric yoga in general uh, there's a lot of uh, asking and getting support from the guru who in the case of open heart is Padmasambhava and Yeshe Chogyal uh, and then the Mahasiddha family of about 40-50 masters uh, yeah so tantric practice means asking and getting support from a guru a Mahasiddha guru uh, and um, through the empowerment of the guru uh, who, which refers to Guru Rinpoche, not to me as a teacher. I'm just a guy who passes it, empowerments. Um, so through empowerment, uh, practitioners, students can uh, get the frequencies of the Buddha deities right, and through that empowerment start to cultivate these enlightened, liberated aspects of the mind and awareness in your own mind system. So, as I was saying in Dublin already two months ago, uh, these Buddha deities, and even though they are connected to Guru Rinpoche and Yeshe Tsogyal, they are really aspects of your own mind. Not in the samsaric form, samsaric state, but in the liberated state, nirvanic state. Okay, uh, so I was talking about, uh, well, poetically saying that, as, they, as it's often been said in Buddhist poetry, that lotuses, which is a symbol for enlightenment and liberation, lotuses grow from mud. And that mud is samsara. Mud is trouble. So, mm, yeah, Buddhism in that sense is, is, is kind of psychologically smart because it doesn't try to bypass this mud. It doesn't try to get the law to somehow bloom and flower on the surface of the water without roots in the mud. It doesn't try that. It knows that the lotus has to have roots in the mud, in order to start from a seed, grow gradually, 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 and then there's the flower of enlightenment, of supreme attainment. So, yeah, I think the uh, Buddhist masters throughout the centuries were onto something, uh, understanding this principle. that suffering, confusion, um, unsatisfactoriness, unsatisfactoriness is the ground of realization, is the fuel of realization. Without it, there cannot be uh, insight, which is the true benefit. There are other benefits, health benefits and so on. But true benefit is the insight, insight into the selfless nature, empty nature of the mind, right?
bit by bit, insights, one by one, from awakening, first boomy open, second boomy open, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, yay! <laughs> Uh, yeah. Like I was saying yesterday that um, um, I have a lot of respect and love for, well, almost all the spiritual traditions all spiritual traditions, but um, the thing is that all methods, it, there's, it's really wisely said that when it's said that uh, all methods can become blind to themselves, including open heart. So, uh, and what it means when a method becomes a tradition, and tradition, um, in time, it has generations, it becomes an old tradition, then what usually happens is that uh, the essence, the core of the whole thing, becomes somehow vague, not that clear. And when that happens, then all kinds of interpretations and um, mistakes start to creep in. This happens in the world of human beings, it happens. It's, it's certain that it happens, um, you know, in, in all lineages, in all traditions. Um, so, what I was saying... Yeah, so I was saying that yesterday I was speaking that uh, if one is not a fully realized being or a Buddha in oriental terms, then one is a samsaric being. So even when in open heart we speak of 13 bumi openings, 13 awakenings, and perf perfecting of those 13 bumis really like um, in simplest terms enlightenment is either on or off if you're not a buddha you are a samsaric being despite of 13 bumi openings and some bumi perfections for example if you still have some traces of Selfing, dualism in your system, it, it uh, puts artificial coloring there. And that means that um, you have to have skillful means to, um, in getting to the natural state, establishing it again and again, and also skillful means uh, in cleaning whatever is left. But as a rule, uh, samsaric beings cannot just sit down, do nothing, uh, do silent illumination or just sitting and be in Buddha nature. Impossible. And there was a question relating to this. How is the natural state different from stillness? By stillness I mean no thoughts and emotions. So, <clears throat> a natural state different from stillness. So, th stillness uh, meaning thoughtlessness. The natural state can be with or without thoughts. Can be both. 
So if we are cutting, through, cutting to the natural state and this transparent awareness just sweeps through our body-mind, that's dharmakaya as aspect of dharmakaya aspect of Buddha nature. But there are other aspects of Buddha nature. Uh, my interpretation, by the way, I'm making a small side comment, is that uh, in Buddhism they speak of three kayas, three Buddha bodies. Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya and Nirmanakaya. So my understanding and my interpretation is that when our whole mind, our whole selfing is purified completely, 100%, in, in open heart terms it means that the first ten bumis become perfected. And then you are in the, on the eleventh bumi, on the first Buddha level, 100%, 24-7, non-stop. Uh, Then it, it, the, the terminology goes that you don't become a Dharmakaya Buddha then, but you become a Nirmanakaya Buddha. Buddha in a form, Buddha in a physical form. So your mind is totally free, but you are still in the body. A Shakyamuni Buddha is a good example of this. He was a Buddha in a physical body. Um, and his mind was totally liberated, but he didn't attain light body. Uh, the legend goes that he died because of food poisoning or something, so he couldn't deal with the food poisoning, so his body died. A, light, a, a, a Buddha of 12th or 13th Bumi would be able to handle it if they wanted. But as I've explained in blog texts and talks, uh, the first stage, first out of three stage of being a Buddha means mental non-duality. Like your whole mind is in non-dual state. It means that your mind that used to be filled with selfing, um, selfing in very gross form, gross negative emotions, stuff, and lighter form, less harmful form, but still uh, stained by the sense of self. All of that has been washed uh, with this transparent awareness. The Dharmakaya awareness has been sort of infused into the whole of mind. And most of you are awakened, so you already know what this, in experience, what it means. So, we, for, for example, we have this sense of self, this subject self, sitting right there behind the eyes. And when we have the insight, the sudden epiphany or sudden flash, the shift, then that entity, that self, that close-minded being, that me is no longer there. But even after that, you can still refer to yourself, to me, to I, uh, but the meaning is different. The meaning is different to yourself, because it doesn't cause the the the, the limitedness, the narrow-mindedness. That cause is gone. So, perfecting the first ten bumis, um, this mental duality, first stage of being a Buddha, means that your whole mind, your all thoughts, all emotions, and the whole substrate consciousness, which substrate consciousness, somebody was asking about it. Uh, so we have this 
uh, I thought, then we have, that's only one, one, it's like a peak of the mountain of selfing, the sh sharpest peak, so the I is the peak, then, there, then there's the, uh, like, some part of the body of the mountain are these inner objects, thoughts and emotions that come from the subconscious mind and, and rise into the heart area, neck and head, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this terrain is between first and sixth boomies. So when you open the sixth boomy, these objects no longer are sticky. That's a good description. They no longer are sticky. They have been, in the same way as the sense of self, they have been released. The, the binding, uh, the charge that causes the, again, the narrow-mindedness, limitedness, that charge is freed from these thoughts and emotions. In Sutra path, like in Theravada, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, so in Sutra path, they investigate, analyze, apply vipassana into these thoughts and emotions one thought one emotion at a time in tantric path well tantric path can be supported by sutra practices i also teach sutra and in open heart we practice also sutra but in the tantric path the method the techniques is different because we have these breathing practices, visualization practices, and most importantly, mantras relating to the Buddha deities. So these Buddha deities automatically do it. They uh, liberate the charges, the self charges from these inner objects. So I was explaining the structure of the selfing of the mind. Subject, many objects, first Bumi, then objects, boomies, one through six, and then there is the substrate consciousness, which is the basis of the selfing. I was speaking of the mountain, so we had the subject on the top, then the center part would be, consists of objects, and then there's the base of the mountain, which is like the uh, densest part which is substrate consciousness, or alaya vijnana, kunci in Tibet. Um, it feels like uh, if we think of a bride on a day of wedding day, the bride has the, what do you call it? Veil. What? Veil. Veil. Yeah, so think of many veils, many such veils. They are thin, but they are there. Thin veils. You can, there might be five or ten of them there, and you can kind of still see through them. And that's the, that's the deceptive part of it. That exactly is the deceptive part, because you can kind of see through them, which means that you can kind of be recognize the equanimity of the Dharmakaya, equanimity of the Buddha nature, but the veils are there. And if you don't know, if you don't have the know-how, nobody has pointed out to you that these veils are there, you're screwed, literally screwed. I've known, um, well, I gave a speech on last summer retreat uh, in July. 
about this old friend who was a Zen monk and he was a Zen monk for life and when he passed away I helped him a little bit after he died and he was stuck in those veils. He had practiced all his life with all the best, greatest Zen masters of our time but he, he didn't receive the ins instruction of differentiating these veils, this substrate consciousness from awareness. And that's why he was in trouble after he died. He was like in this, stuck in this fogginess, dullness, just like he'd been meditating his life. So it's really serious. And this is something that the Chokchen masters warn about that you have to know the difference between substrate consciousness and awareness. Because substrate consciousness, even though you might not have thoughts, it might be thoughtless. And in that sense, yeah, it's free because there's no thoughts in here. But if the veils are there, it's not the real freedom. But it's not difficult, it's just... Um, so in a sense, uh, when I'm saying this, it's sort of like criticism towards many schools of Buddhism and many schools of meditation who don't underline this. It's kind of criticism. But if it's criticism, I'm saying in a, it in a constructive spirit. Uh, because I've been in that trouble myself. So I would want to know, I would want to know how to practice correctly. Um, so first things first. And Yeah, I was saying that, uh, so it's not difficult, or maybe it, it can be in the beginning. Somebody was asking here that, uh, where is it? I am never sure when to use pet mantra, and when I do, I don't notice much difference. Certainly the natural state is not apparent. I'm never sure when to use the pet mantra, and when I do, I don't notice much difference. So, it sounds like uh, in the beginning, when you haven't had a, the first Bumi opening, awakening, and or haven't had many other Bumi openings, uh, maybe the difference is not that clear. In that case, just keep doing it, and it will come clear. It will come clear when you get to the 11th Bumi, when you have had 11 openings, then you will know the difference. Uh, and I was saying that, that um, even if the glimpses into the natural state are short, half a second, one second, it makes all the difference. Short moments make all the difference. If we think of a storage room that is filled with junk and it's dark there and we are standing there, but when the lights go on, for one second. For that one second we see that room. Without that one second of light, lights being switched on, we wouldn't know anything. We wouldn't know even that. So when we have that one second of glimpse, even though if it doesn't uh, cause irreversible shift, even if it's not a boomy opening, it still matters greatly. You just keep doing the practice, getting 
another glimpse and another, another second, another second, and another, and another, and another. And that's the way to go about it. Uh, mm, so the first question... Yes, this I explained. Stillness, thoughts, emotions. Can you explain exactly what substrate consciousness is? Was it clear enough? Thin veils. Dullness, fogginess, sleepiness. Uh, muddiness, kind of stuck in the mud. I often use that, that analogy, stuck in the mud. Yep. As you progress and open more boomies, do you need the pet mantra less and less? What do you think? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Eventually, you know, I bet it must feel wonderful when the job is done, there's no selfing happening in any way or form, and you don't have to use any practices, ever. <laughs> it must be great. It's sort of like, uh, I have two small kids, and uh, you remember when you were a child, when you started to grow out from children's clothes and shoes. Your shoes got small and some clothes got small, and you got bigger clothes. And also, when, when um, in Finland we have the age, age limit is 18, I think also in UK and Ireland, and it was like a, such a long wait from 15 or 16 years old to get to the 18 to be able to do adult stuff. So it was like a long, hard wait to get to be an adult of 18 years old. Uh, but then someday it happened and it gave you much more freedom. It gave you, how do you say, f freedoms, no? Is it, is it understandable? Yeah. 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 So, sticking with it and one day getting the ultimate freedom. ultimate freedom of, of the natural state. Because after all, it's just cleaning. Cleaning of the junk. And there has to come a point when the cleaning is done. Even if the place, if you were cleaning a place, a building like this, and we were yesterday a little bit, because it was there was so much junk on the floors and on the walls. But even if we were talking about a big palace, like the palace of the Queen of England, uh, even if you were scrubbing and cleaning it all by yourself, at some point it would be clean. Well, let's think that in our image it would. Because if you, if you were actually cleaning a <laughs> queen's palace, by the time you got to the <laughs> two kilometers, two square kilometers big palace, then the other side would already be dusty <laughs> and so on. But in our, you know, perfect analogy, it works. So, uh, absolutely, less and less pet mantra. But in the beginning, uh, as I said yesterday, don't be shy to use it. And you're actually using it quite well. Finns are much, much more shy. Uh, so, that's good. Mm. 
Mm. There was another question. Could you explain what the self is composed of? In other word, in other words, it it's consti constituent. Con constituent. What? Constituent. Constituent. Is that right? Constitutes. Constitutes. Constituent parts and describe how we purify each part. <coughs> yeah, so... <clears throat> well, this is a good analogy. If we think of a keyboard of a piano, grand piano, it has white keys and black keys. And it's, it's about this range. So, if we think that that range is our whole mind from the low keys of substrate consciousness, that foggy, veiled area, to the subconscious mind, which where the where the thoughts and emotions become formed and where they arise from, like the mid low keys. Then we have the kind of the central keys of uh, thoughts and emotions, and then we have the high keys, uh, thoughts and emotions, including the sense of self, the subject, and then we have the high keys of plain awareness. But this analogy is, is not perfect because plain awareness actually underlies the whole, whole range of keys. <coughs> but <coughs> in Tantric teachings we have uh, wrathful and peaceful deities, wrathful and peaceful Buddhas. In Tibetan Heart Yoga there are something like eight or ten wrathful ones. So these wrathful ones uh, that often are depicted in paintings like <laughs> like having fears ex expression. You have seen them, right? So they are fears because in the lower keys it's the most, it's the stickiest. It's like in Lord of the Rings terms, it's like the Mordor of our mind. So to able to overcome those orcs and Sauron of our mind, we need to have as, you know, fearless, as strong, as fierce, as wrathful heroes in dualistic terms. So these wrathful deities, uh, they transform, they, they turn it upside down. It's sort of like when you have weeds in the garden that are a nuisance, you turn them upside down and the roots of the weeds dry out. That's why the wrathful ones are there. They turn the land of the Mordor upside down. <laughs> and then there are the peaceful ones and compassionate ones like Avalokiteshvara and Avalokiteshvari White Tara uh, for the mid keys. Same thing, transforms, releases, liberates the self-charge in those, um, in that kind of selfing that is not, not strong, that is not like dramatic, but it's still there. And then there are uh, Buddha deities, aspects of Guru Rinpoche and Yeshe Tsogyal in our practice that 
are uh, aspects of the three highest Bhumis, the Mahasiddha Bhumis. So there is, oh, now I'm in trouble because I don't remember the ne- remember them all. But the 13 Bhumi Buddhas are Kuntusangpo and Kuntusangmo, which means Buddha of all goodness. The second one is what it is. Dorche Chang. Yes, Dor- Dorche Chang, um, which is Vajradara and Sarasvati. <coughs> Sarasvati, maybe. Uh, you can check it from the website. <laughs> and the last pair of 11th Bumi is Nima Özer and uh, actually it's Nima Özer and Sarasvati and on 12th is Dorche Chang and uh, Prasna Paramita. So these Buddhas of 11th, 12th and 13th Bumis that are included in the deities of Tibetan Heart Yoga are the underlying underlying pure awareness in the Mordor field and also in the Shire uh, area. You know, does this analogy make sense? Do you understand? I will do the last question as well. And if these are all the questions I'm getting during the whole retreat, and I've already covered all of them in the first speech, I'm in trouble <laughs> from tomorrow onwards. I have to, you know, make up stuff here sitting. So the question is, why is Padmasambhava the guru of open heart? Why not Sakyamuni Buddha? Well, it's a good question. Or why not some of the many, many, many other Buddhas? Well, Shakyamuni had the mission of, of in his lifetime to bring out and try to establish Sutra Buddhism, Sutra teachings. And uh, there has been many others like him uh, beings who came took physical body and then had the well desire also and will but also uh, the mission to establish some dharma teachings in padmasambhava's case um, in his life in uh, what is it 8th 9th centuries in tibet uh, he took vajrayana teachings to tibet um, and that's why he's such a central figure in um, all schools of tibetan buddhism so that was his job at that time. Um, the purpose of open heart is to is to like years ago, about ten years ago, one Mahasiddha, Babaji, who was and is very dear to me and very close to me, he uh, gave me my marching orders and he told me that your job is to uh, gather the bits and pieces pieces of wisdom, wisdom teachings that are scattered around the world in different traditions and then put those techniques together and I've done that with the support with the irreplaceable support of Babaji, Tirumular, Machik Labdron. Machik Labdron is a Tibetan lady, Mahasiddha, 
who lived about a thousand years ago, and also with the help of Padmasambhava, uh, Yesha Chogyal, Karab Dorche, Vimalamitra, these uh, big names of Vajrayana Buddhism. Without their help, if, if it was just me collecting different kinds of techniques together and trying to uh, make a system out of it, uh, it wouldn't work. Because there always, when a new lineage of teachings is, is established, there needs to be a Mahasiddha, a master to put the Jews in there. By Jews, I mean the power of empowerment. So, um, so the purpose of open heart is to um, have and create and establish as simple as possible and as pragmatic as possible method for the modern man and woman. And, and this is the, to say, punchline. This is the punchline. So that the method has the potential to fulfill the promise of Vajrayana teachings, which is to attain Buddhahood in this body, in this life. And this is the reason, sometimes people ask me that, well, all this tantric stuff and deities and gurus, uh, I don't, kind of sounds too exotic, it's not, why do you have to teach that stuff? Why don't you just teach two-part formula and simple sutra meditations and just teach like that because it would probably be, have more appeal to more people. But the thing is that uh, it would actually lose the juice. Like I was saying, in Theravada style practice they uproot one thought and one emotion at a time. If you have million of those weeds, it takes quite a while to uproot those stuff. Instead, if you have a tantric practice and these deities, deities of the whole range of piano keys, you're hitting all the... Well, it, it would sound chaotic actually if you did that with an actual piano, but you're kind of hitting all the keys at once. Covering everything at once. Not only one. And then after some time getting, you know, releasing that stuff and then taking the next key and punching that for one or two or three years or more years on a retreat. So that's the answer to, to that question. Um, and I understand that skepticism. I was a Zen Buddhist, a devout a Zen Buddhist myself when I first started for four years. And I hated the idea of, uh, well, I didn't hate Tantric Buddhism or other teachings, but I hated the idea that I would have to try or have to change my Zen Buddhist for something else. I didn't, you know, I was perfectly happy with Zen Buddhism, but after four years of sitting eight hours a day, every day, 365 days a year, I, I had to, I came to a situation where I had to honestly say that I'm pretty much the same guy as I was four years ago. Like, what? 15,000 hours of sitting before, before 15,000 hours of sitting. So, 
to me there was no point to continue that and i actually had a like a like a nervous overheating also so i was uh, pouring sweat for two or three days and i realized that okay this is not for me so i kind of i had this i was totally happy with zen buddhism but then i had to because i had that experience of overheating and uh, I honestly kind of realized that this is not working for me. I kind of <coughs> had to open my view for other things. And then it t- didn't take long when I found my way to Tantric teachings and Babaji and other masters. And I haven't looked back since. When I did my first tantric practice, the difference was so big. I remember when I did week-long uh, Zen retreats, the effect of a week-long retreat, which is like, what, 12 or 14 hours of sitting a day, seven days. How much is that altogether? Like 90 hours? 90 hours of sitting would equal, when I started tantric practice in 2006, uh, I would get the same benefit, same clarity in my mind with about half an hour, 45 minutes of tantric practice. Immense difference. But I was also ready for it. I was actually desperate for it. Because, you know, when you sit eight hours a day for four years without a break, it kind of drives home some essential points. Uh, but the question was, why Padmasambhava? Why, Padmasambhava? why not Sakyamuni? So, <clears throat> um, I don't know, maybe Sakyamuni could or couldn't pass tantric teachings, but I think that his orientation is to stick with um, like this sutra style teachings. That's one thing. Another, another thing is that similarly Padmasambhava has, he's like the, can you say kingpin, kingpin? Like the master of tantric. Tantric teachings and Chokchen. One of the greatest masters. In Chokchen they speak of three greatest, which who are Garab Dorche, who was the one who was the first to teach Chokchen in the human world about two thousand years ago, soon after Jesus. Garab Dorche. The second one is Vimala Mitra. We have Vimala Mitra's wisdom meditations in open heart. I received those from him a few years ago. And then there's the third one, Guru Rinpoche. These three, Karab Dorje, Vimala Mitra, Guru Rinpoche, the biggest names of Chokchen. But then there's, of course, um, a lot of others, a lot of other great masters. So, why Padmasambhava? Because he's the man for it. Uh, and also, of course, if me and my wife, as the head teacher and as persons who received the teachings, if we didn't have the karmic connection with him, uh, it wouldn't happen. So that factor is also necessary. Okay, that, that's been a long talk of whole bunch of topics. I don't think I will speak in the next few days. It's been so, you know, big task. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, but let's sit a little bit together. It's 20 minutes until 3, until the break. Let's sit together. <laughs>